Thank you all for coming this evening. We are so pleased to be able to have you all here and to bring you tonight's program with Larry Millette. Please consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and all of our efforts. And there are some great benefits to joining, including our quarterly magazine, Ramsey County History. You may find out more about RCHS on our website, including upcoming programs, how to join or donate, membership benefits, and much more. The address is www.rchs.com. And I want to thank those of you who are on the program tonight who are members, supporters, and donors. We so appreciate everything that you do and all of our wonderful volunteers who are here tonight as well. Um, on Thursday, November 18th, next week, we at seven o'clock on Zoom, we have another really special history revealed program with well known author and art historian Julie L'Enfant, who will be sharing her new book, The Spirit Tree, Hazel Belvo and the Art of Nature. It's a fantastic book. Um, I'm really looking forward to this program as well as tonight's. And again, this will be on Zoom. See our website for more details and the Zoom registration. So as a reminder, again, please keep your microphones and personal cameras turned off during the program. You can type your questions and comments in the chat and we'll read out those for Larry to answer. This program is being recorded and it will be up on our Ramsey County Historical Society YouTube channel in a few days. The Ramsey County Historical Society would like to acknowledge the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Makoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people, just as we celebrate the contributions of the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website. Again, it's www.rchs.com. This full statement includes actionable ways in which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples of Minnesota, Mekoche. Our CHS is committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in of our community, and we are so pleased to bring you tonight's program with Larry Millet. Larry is a native of Minneapolis, is a graduate of St. John's University in Collegeville and the University of Chicago. He is a writer, reporter, and editor, or he was a writer, reporter, and editor for the St. Paul Pioneer Press. In 1984, he won a Knight Fellowship to the University of Michigan to study architectural history and theory. When he'd returned to St. Paul in 1985, Millet became the newspaper's first architecture critic. He held that post until his retirement from the Pioneer Press in June of 2002. While at the Pioneer Press, some of you may remember that Larry and fellow reporter Don Boxmeyer also served for several years as the clue writers for the annual Winter Carnival Medallion Hunt. Uh, Larry has written so many articles and books for publications, um, including Architecture, Inland Architect, Architecture Minnesota, and Minnesota History Magazines, plus 14 works of nonfiction, including a number of AIA guides, plus Metropolitan Dreams, The Scandalous Rise and Stunning Fall of a Minneapolis Masterpiece, Once There Were Castles, which we'll be talking about tonight, Lost Mansions and Estates of the Twin Cities, Twin Cities Then and Now, Lost Twin Cities, Minnesota Modern Architecture and Life at Mid-Century, and Minnesota's Own Preserving Our Grand Homes. He has also written nine mystery novels, which are really great, which feature Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson, as well as St. Paul saloon keeper and part-time detective Shadwell Rafferty. There's so much to list, and I don't have time tonight, but please see our website for Larry's complete biography and the list of works. Um, it's on the event page for tonight's program. And I also want to thank our partner in um, our History Revealed programs, Subtext Books, which is downtown St. Paul on 5th Street. So check them out. Get your books there. And I want to turn this over to Larry Millett. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. 
Thank you for the introduction. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about um, some houses and mansions from uh, my book, Once There Were Castles, which uh, I just realized came out 10 years ago. And um, it seems like just yesterday, but uh, time goes on. Um, we're going to focus on houses uh, in St. Paul. Uh, Once There Were Castles uh, actually uh, covers, and for some reason, it's not moving. Hold on here. We seem to be uh, having a problem here already. Uh, 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 let's see. Um, oh, here we go. Oh boy, things are not moving very well here. Hold on a minute. We're going to see if we can get this technical glitch. Um, okay, we'll just do it with the other way around here. Um, for some reason, my little down key isn't working. Uh, we're going to uh, do Once There Were Castles. The book came out 10 years ago, and I talked about mansions all throughout um, the metropolitan area of the Twin Cities, but we're going to focus uh, tonight on some of the houses that uh, were once the great mansions in St. Paul that have disappeared over the years. Um, by my estimate, uh, there are at least 600 lost mansions in the Twin Cities, and that number is undoubtedly conservative. Uh, people often ask me, how does this happen? Why do these houses go away? And it's kind of the urban history of America. Uh, cities are built up. Uh, they're rebuilt and built again, downtowns expand, mansions disappear, houses burn down. There's all sorts of different reasons why these big houses, um, many of them have disappeared over the years. Um, so we're going to just focus on a few of the more, uh, what I hope are the more interesting ones. And we're going to take a little tour of St. Paul um, by looking at um, some of the old mansion districts uh, in the city. This is this uh, most um, uh, inelegant map that I, I hand drew some years back to show um, where some of the mansion districts, the old mansion districts in St. Paul were. And since I'm sure most of you are St. Paulites, you know that where they were was up on the hills around downtown. Um, wealth craves altitude. Uh, New York City is the uh, monument to that in terms of people living in their tall apartment buildings. And in St. Paul, um, the mansion builders really starting in the 1850s uh, built all around the downtown core um, up in the hills from the capital area to the east side to uh, College Avenue and Summit Hill and around to the west side. Um, and most of the mansions that were built in the early days in those neighborhoods are now gone. Some remain obviously on Summit. Um, some in Dayton's Bluff, a few on the west side, um, but a lot of the mansion districts, as we'll see, have completely disappeared. They have just been wiped out uh, because of changes in the urban environment. So, um, oh boy, I'm still, oh, here we go. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Lower Town and Dayton's Bluff um, and uh, talk about some of the houses that were there uh, at various times. Um, here's a, a picture of a, of a one of the last surviving houses in Lower Town from the 1950s. Um, and we will see that there was actually a very large mansion district in Lower Town, but not in what we think of today as Lower Town, but is the area just to the east up north of um, uh, West 7th or East 7th Street, um, uh, just past the uh, Spaghetti Junction. And we'll, we'll talk about that here in a minute. So, all right. Um, the biggest early mansion district in St. Paul was this area right here where I'm circling. And this is uh, Spaghetti Junction right here, uh, 94, 35E is just off to our left there. And then the Lafayette Highway 52 bridge is right here. And this is Lafayette. This neighborhood, which is now entirely commercial and office uh, and industrial, uh, St. Paul Police Department is here also, um, Ramsey County Jail. This neighborhood was once chock-a-block with large houses, um, many, many of them, uh, probably in the neighborhood of 100 large houses at one time here, plus many smaller houses. The big mansion district, the, the, the heart of the mansion district, the Summit Avenue of this district, was a little street called Woodward Avenue, which still exists right off of Payne here on the east side, but the mansion district was on the west side of what is Trout, this is Trout Brook Valley, the railroad tracks that go through here today. And right through here, right through here was Woodward Avenue and many of the early mansions, the biggest early mansions from the 1850s on upward were through here. Um, sometimes it's called the Lafayette Park area and Lafayette Park, long gone, was right here um, at Grove Street 
and Lafayette in this parking lot here. And that was sort of the central focus of this neighborhood, which was considered um, close to downtown in those days, it still is, uh, but it was kind of a walkable city when the first mansions were built. And so people built their houses close to, to the downtown area where the most of the commercial activity was. And so this area, which had a nice kind of a view of the river, um, had Trout Brook running by it. Um, that brook is now underground and the railroad tracks have taken over that valley, but that was um, uh, quite considered quite a scenic area, uh, kind of a little wooded bluffs along here. And some of the early mansions were right in this neighborhood. Um, here's a view of Woodward Avenue, the, um, east from Lafayette Road, uh, circa 18, what do I got here? Get rid of this little thing up here. Um, circa 1887. Uh, and this is the only picture I've ever really found of this mansion district. As you can see, there are big houses here, barely see because of so many trees, um, behind the walls. And it extended for several blocks and names that you will recognize um, in St. Paul history had their first big houses on this street. Um, here's a picture of Lafayette Park, uh, which um, uh, stood, uh, as I said, at Grove and Lafayette, just a little kind of a square, nothing very fancy, but it was uh, sort of like Rice Park today, uh, not Rice Park, more like uh, Irvine Park in the sense that they had houses around it. Uh, it was just a pleasant little green space around which this early um, mansion district developed. Um, here's three of the Woodward Avenue mansions, and you'll, um, you'll notice the names are, if you're a St. Paul historian, and even if you're not a St. Paul historian, they're, they're probably pretty familiar. Uh, the Horace Thompson House, Thompson is maybe the least well known of these, but he was one of the founders of the First National Bank of St. Paul. And this was his mansion over here, beautiful Italian style house built in 1860, uh, probably the nicest of the early mansions in the Woodward Avenue district. Amherst Wilder, who later built his big mansion uh, up on Summit Avenue next to the James J. Hill House. And of course, the Amherst Wilder Foundation is still very much uh, alive in St. Paul today and um, does many good things for the city. And then the Jacob Bass uh, Henry Sibley House. Uh, Bass made his fortune as a tavern keeper, which was a good profession to be in in the early days of St. Paul. Uh, and of course, Henry Sibley later moved into this house. He was the first uh, territorial or the first um, uh, representative congressman from Minnesota and also the state's first governor, uh, fur trader who later branched out into many, many different activities. These are typical of the early generation of mansions in St. Paul. They were mostly either Italian in style um, with a tower made of stone or brick. This house, the, the Sibley house had a little cupola on top. Um, and they were relatively small compared to the mansions to come. If you had a house uh, in St. Paul uh, or Minneapolis uh, in the 1850s, if you were relatively well-to-do and could build a house, if you had a 5,000 square foot house, that was considered gigantic. Um, wait about 25, 30 years and the houses became 25,000 square feet. Uh, if you had a lot of money. Um, so a lot of things changed over that time. These houses are also interesting in that they were built before the age of railroads. You can see the 1860, 1863, 1860, the first railroad line, which came through Trout Brook Valley, uh, which only extended to Minneapolis, was built in 1862. Before railroads, it was harder to get materials. They had to come up by steamboat um, from other locales. And so typically these houses were built of the local uh, material, locally made brick, uh, or more commonly um, the Platteville limestone, which underlies St. Paul. I live in the West 7th Street area, and this whole neighborhood is uh, full of old quarries, quarries where they used to dig out the limestone. And that grayish to yellowish buff colored stone, uh, which you still see on uh, building foundations all around St. Paul, um, was the stone of choice. Uh, really until uh, the 1870s when uh, rail connections improved, you could start getting stone from other and brick from other locations. And then you got a much wider array of materials available to you. All of these people, Thompson, Wilder, Sibley, well not Sibley, but Thompson and Wilder later um, built mansions on Summit Avenue. And one of the things that happened in St. Paul, which didn't really, happen, didn't really happen in Minneapolis was that there was a consolidation really in the 1880s 
uh, in on Summit Avenue in St. Paul. And a lot of the mansions that have kind of been spread around other places, people sold them, uh, abandoned them, whatever, and they tended to build or move into mansions on Summit Avenue and that consolidate into the what is still the, the great mansion district um, of St. Paul today. Um, here's another house uh, at 357 East 9th Street. This was at 9th and Olive. This would be just to the east of uh, Spaghetti Junction and just to the north of um, 7th Street in an area that's now, as I said, very much industrial office. There are no houses there. Um, and this was the Monroe Shire house and Shire uh, was one of the early master builders in St. Paul. Before the 1880s, by and large, uh, professionally trained architects weren't much in evidence um, anywhere in Minnesota and, and not in St. Paul or Minneapolis. And so if you were a rich person and wanted to build a big house, you hired either hire an architect from out of town uh, to prepare plans, or you hired one of the local master builders who were essentially contractors, build and design contractors who would design your house uh, and also build it. Shire's house, interestingly enough, which is um, another big Italian at French Second Empire concoction, the French Second Empire style always had the mansard roof. Um, his house is wood. And um, most of these big houses were actually uh, brick or stone. Uh, but if your budget was more limited and Shire was uh, well-to-do, but not big, huge money, uh, he built this big house out of, um, uh, what um, I should actually um, a lot of the um, I should mention that a lot of the um, these early houses in the Woodward Avenue area if you notice when they all disappeared 1904 1903 1896 um, what happened right around the turn of the century is that the railroad development really picked up there um, more tracks were built through Trout Valley and you did not want to live near steam locomotive lines in the 19th century. They were very messy, very dirty, very noisy. And so the rich folks moved out um, to other locales that were further away from, from the railroad tracks, uh, most notably Summit Avenue. Um, and these houses were in many cases um, either turned into rooming houses, uh, rental properties for a time, and then um, were gradually demolished as industrial uses um, and new railroad uses took over uh, the neighborhood. And, and the Shire House, uh, same situation. The, in 1917, the uh, Great Northern Rail Railway built uh, an enormous freight depot in this neighborhood, which still stands. Some of the buildings that are part of that still stand. They're no longer uh, used by the railroad. And um, a whole bunch of houses, block after block of big houses were torn down to make way for that new railroad facility. Uh, and among the uh, people who built a house in this neighborhood was a fellow named James J. Hill. This was, of course, his first house, uh, which was at 9th in Canada. And this house basically was in the middle of what is Spaghetti Junction today. Um, and this was his first mansion, uh, not as big uh, as his uh, later house on Summit, and uh, not really a particularly grand house. Didn't have a tower, or if it had one, the the roof had been, uh, the tower part of it had been cut off. You can see this little thing in front here, but a classic French Second Empire house with a mansard roof, um, the big bracketed eaves, very tall proportions, and these hoods uh, made of stone or iron um, that were a feature of the style over the windows. And, and when you see houses like this, um, those hoods are usually kind of, or crowns as they call them, are kind of a giveaway. Uh, the big remaining example of this style in St. Paul is the Alexander Ramsey House in Irvine Park, built in 1872. Otherwise, most of the Italian, uh, most of the big French Second Empire houses in St. Paul, uh, of which there were many, are, are gone. Here's another one, uh, the Conrad Gotzian House. And this was on East 10th Street, um, near where the, um, uh, just, be just west of where 94 starts swinging into um, Spaghetti Junction um, and uh, where District Energy has a, a cooling tower and a facility of some sort there. This is actually one of the last houses in what we think of as Lower Town today, not that other part of Lower Town to the east, but what we think of as the warehouse district today. This was one of the last big surviving houses in that neighborhood to be torn down 
uh, in the 1960s. Gatsin was, um, as some of you probably know, a uh, uh, shoe manufacturer. And I had a big facility, a uh, big factory and building warehouse down in Lower Town, uh, which uh, still stands, was, and uh, in fact was designed by a, a fellow named Cass Gilbert. Um, so he was one of the many early businessmen, manufacturers, wholesalers, um, who um, I call them the merchant princes, who made their, their early fortunes uh, in St. Paul. And this is very typical of those big early houses. And what you'll notice also about these houses is that they were actually, you know, they had the big mansard roof, but they're pretty simple houses. They're basically big boxes. Um, we have to wait till the Victorian era when there was uh, a wide array of materials and ornamental goods available before we start seeing those more wild and woolly Queen Anne style houses that are much more complex uh, and multi-layered than these early mansions uh, typically were. Um, among the, I mean, the, the, the great mansion probably on uh, this early mansion district extending up toward Dayton's Bluff uh, was the Theodore Ham House, which overlooked Sweet Hollow, uh, a famous house in St. Paul history. You see here the house sitting on top of the hollow overlooking on the east side of it, overlooking the, um, there were mills in here at one time and manufactories. And of course, later we know many small houses um that were along the uh, Phelan Creek and the the brewery is there right right beside uh right down the hill from the house and uh parts of this brewery complex the original one that's shown here circa 1900 still stand uh but the brew house uh dome which once dominated the structure uh no longer does the a lot of the facility was modernized at various times uh, but parts of it, parts of the old brewery are, are still there, obviously, and still uh, finding new uses, um, and hopefully more uh, in the future. Uh, the Ham Mansion uh, was um, built was at 671 Greenbrier, the street right on the east side of the hollow. It uh, was built in 1887 for Theodore Ham. It was actually built by his son, William, while Theodore and his wife were vacationing in Europe, and it does have the look of one of those uh, castles that um, maybe Ham and his wife saw when they were touring down the Rhine and the old country. Um, and Gager built this very elaborate house on this large lot. You can see how much they terraced it here because of the steep hills um, in 1887. And a um, few pictures here of the interior. Generally speaking, there aren't a lot of good interiors of most of the Victorian houses that were um, fashionable in St. Paul. There are some. Um, uh, but here's a picture here of the, some of the members of the Ham family gathering in the early 1900s. Uh, very large family. Um, this is the site where um, William Ham Jr. was kidnapped in 1933 from this neighborhood uh, by the Carpus Barker gang and later released after the payment of a $100,000 ransom. Um, anyway, very grand house, very grand Victorian. And uh, unfortunately, um, in 1954, uh, it suffered a fatal fire. A 14-year-old boy got into there. Uh, the house was actually being uh, restored or, or fixed to be used as a group home of some kind. And a 14-year-old uh, got in there. He had matches and up it went. And you can see how much wood was part of the interior of the house and even the, um, the little uh, cylindrical roof or the uh, uh, conical roof there. And so it just burned out the whole house and it really wasn't salvageable, unfortunately. Had this uh, house survived that fire uh, or not been burned down by the boy, um, I think it would still be around today because of its importance to the history of St. Paul. The brewing industry was tremendously important to St. Paul. The German community was tremendously important to St. Paul um, and might be, a, um, who knows what it might be today, but um, it's one of the big losses. Those of you familiar with the neighborhood will know if you go up there, there are still a number of big ham family houses up in that neighborhood uh, that do still stand. Um, and there was kind of a, an enclave there. Uh, families in the 19th century and early 20th century uh, tended to live in close proximity more so necessarily than they do today. Um, so you found these little clusters of family groups, uh, especially involving uh, wealthier people. Um, another of the big mansion districts in St. Paul that is completely, totally, utterly wiped out was known as Capitol Heights um, Central Park. 
Um, this was the area around and mostly north of the state capitol, although there were some houses also to the south and east and west of where the capital is um, uh, that were, were quite spectacular. But the biggest houses were kind of on those hills right of, above and past the capital, um, north of University Avenue, and especially, uh, particularly along Sherburn um, Avenue. And um, this was called Capitol Heights. There's still a Capitol Heights Boulevard up there. Um, and you can see this picture from 1896, looking up toward from Wabasha Street here, looking uh, more or less north. And you can see the big houses up here and the Capitol was gonna be built right up in this, uh, right up in this area um, in the late uh, 1890s and then completed in 1905. And the Capitol was really the, I called it in my book, a white marble missile that got shot into this um, district and it kind of blew it up. Uh, as state government expanded, uh, as the city grew, uh, all these mansions one by one began going away, uh, being torn down uh, to make way for new uses, uh, and in many cases, government uses. One of the first houses, uh, one of the first, what you call them, uh, early mansion up here was the William Ames house, uh, which was built in 1854. And it was a, a Gothic revival house, not particularly large. Uh, Ames was part of that family, uh, uh, that uh, the same Ames Shovel Company out of uh, Massachusetts, which uh, not only um, manufactured shovels used by Union troops in the Civil War, but members of that family are also the builders of the Union Pacific Railway. And I did a column about this house uh, for the Strib recently, which I pointed out that some of the scenes for the movie Knives Out were filmed in one of the Ames family mansions in Massachusetts. Well, William's Aim, William Ames was one of the sons of the founder of the, of the big uh, enormous shovel company and, and iron company. And he moved out to St. Paul in the 1850s, built a relatively small house, and then uh, actually had a farm out on the east side in what's called Hazel Park. And his son was also William, was one of the early developers of, of Hazel Park. Well, after Ames died, the house was sold to Yuri Lamprey, who was an early uh, lawyer in St. Paul, uh, who was involved in all sorts of uh, early activities with the state legislature and drafting laws, also quite a conservationist, had a big um, farm up near Forest Lake that is now known as the Lamprey Pass uh, uh, area. Um, and um, this house started out with a very, this is kind of this little part you see here with the steep little roof. This was kind of the start of the house and Lamprey came in and expanded it enormously into this giant Victorian confection with the towers, the one of the few three level porches I've ever seen on a house in St. Paul. Um, balconies, bays, windows, chimneys, a painter's nightmare. Um, and uh, he lived in this house uh, until the time of his death, um, which was right uh, on Central Avenue, basically um, where um, the State Judicial Building is today. Uh, this house was raised to make way for uh, the State Historical Society building, uh, which was built in 1917. And then that in turn was, was turned in, uh, expanded and turned into the State Judicial Center when the Historical Society built there. Uh, new building in the 90s. And um, that's where this house was. And Central Park, which we'll see here. Uh, no, wait, 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 I'm having trouble here. Hold on. Um, okay, I think I lost that slide. But Central Park was um, right below uh, the area. Uh, uh, we'll get to that later. Central Park was right below this house, um, just south of the Capitol today and where the um, Centennial Office building is now. So uh, among the other houses here, the, the two great houses in this neighborhood, uh, Capitol Heights, were the John Merriam House and the William Merriam House. Um, one was built in 1882, the other in 1887. John, who had built this house, which later became, as many of you will recall, the uh, the home of the Science Museum, was now the Science Museum of Minnesota for I can't get any uh, that, um, that house was um, uh, right across the street from uh, William Marion's house. And William Marion was, uh, among other things, the governor of Minnesota uh, in the 1890s. And he built this house in 1882. This is Cedar Street right here. This is University Avenue. So this camera is planted 
right where the state capitol is today. Uh, you're looking at that before the underpass was built that carried university underneath Cedar. If you go up Cedar Street today, portions of this wall, at least the last time I was up there of the Merriam House still stand. Uh, and you can see the big mansions behind it up on Sherburn. Um, my guess is that there were probably at one time 30 or more houses up in this neighborhood that might qualify as mansions by, um, by today's standards. Uh, but these two were among um, the finest. The John Merriam House at 51 University, uh, designed by a firm called Mould and McNichol, was I think one of the handful of greatest uh, Victorian era mansions in the Twin Cities and in St. Paul. Uh, it's a beautiful example of this rock bound style that's sometimes called a Romanesque revival or a Richardsonian Romanesque after the great Boston architect, H.H. H. Richardson, who was kind of the master of that particular style. You can see the beautiful stonework. It was done in two colors of Lake Superior sandstone, that beautiful reddish sandstone that they quarry in um, <clears throat> near Bayfield, Wisconsin and over into Michigan. And um, just a beautifully uh, detailed house, um, very, very nicely designed with lots of elegant features, all the woodwork you could dream of inside. And um, this house, um, was later in 1927 became the home of the uh, was was now the Science Museum of Minnesota and um, uh, the same, I think they called it the, the St. Paul Science Museum can't remember the exact name uh, until they built a new Science Museum in the 60s up on 10th Street and then of course that in turn was replaced by the present of Science Museum along the river today uh, but this picture gives you a sense uh, especially this one of how extensive the mansion district here was. Uh, Miriam's house took up a whole block and that was not uncommon for these early mansions. They would often have a block's worth of land, even in downtown areas, especially in Minneapolis, not so much in St. Paul because the downtown was so compact. Um, but um, one of the great houses, I think, in the, in the history of the Twin Cities. Uh, here's a picture of the William Marion house uh, from Robert Street. We're looking on Robert Street here coming up the hill and there was this wonderful um, staircase and wall and there was, this was Sherburn Avenue right up here on just to the uh, right. Um, and um, it used to be that I could walk up here. This is now called Cass Gilbert Park. And there's that lookout, that concrete lookout on the hilltop here. It used to be I could find the top of this wall uh, buried sort of in the dirt up there in the parking lot. Uh, although the last time I was up there, I, don't, I couldn't seem to find it, which would indicate either it's been taken out to some degree, or I just couldn't find it, which is probably the more likely possibility. Uh, and there used to also be some evidence of this there, still visible, but that um, too, I didn't notice the last time I was here. Uh, but quite a uh, quite an elegant district, um, and I think one of the um, one of the finer ones in St. Paul. Here's another picture of this area looking from the top. And uh, here you can see uh, the George Benz house at 5 Sherburn Avenue, at the end of Sherburn Avenue. You get a sense of this lookout here in the staircase. The uh, Miriam House would be kind of back over here uh, to the left. And uh, Benz uh, was uh, another of the early Germans in St. Paul. And whereas Ham had gone into beer, Benz went into distilling and uh, ran um, a big wholesale liquor operation in St. Paul, owned a number of uh, distilleries in Kentucky. Uh, and um, that family uh, was very prominent in St. Paul for a long time. Uh, later built a mansion out on, on Mississippi River Boulevard. Um, and this house was designed by an architect named Emil Ulrici, about whom I know next to nothing. He was one of those short-lived guys in St. Paul and um, uh, did a few houses, but this is a very romantic house sitting up here on top of the bluff uh, with a wonderful view of the city. There was a little lookout up here in the tower, I'm told, and um, a lot of big fancy rooms and just a, a, a really wonderful house. And you see it came down in 1948. Um, and uh, the Merriam House, which we just saw, the John Merriam House was actually the last of the mansions to come down in 1964. And the state administration building is now on that site. And up here on Sherburn now, there's basically a parking lot here, uh, is what this is. Uh, and um, there are no mansions all left on Sherburn. Uh, here's another one of those Sherburn Avenue mansions, the Charles Pitts. Hitch House, 41 Sherburn Avenue. As you can see, these houses were mostly built in the 1880s. And that was the great age of growth and development in St. Paul and Minneapolis. It was the great boom decade for the cities in which they 
expanded enormously in area and population. And because at this time, all sorts of railroad service was available. St. Paul was a great railroad center, as was Minneapolis. You could get materials from all over the country, brick, stone, uh, ornamental terracotta, whatever you wanted. And so the houses from the 1880s were much more elaborate and much bigger because the people had more money uh, than they were in the 1850s and 60s. And there were just a whole lot of these Victorians uh, floating around. We still know that they're up on summit, parts of the uh, Dayton's Bluff, other sections of the city, uh, Hill District, you can still find plenty of these houses, but many, many of the bigger ones um, are gone. Um, here's Central Park. Uh, in Central Park, uh, we're looking uh, from the, with, with the capital area, south toward downtown. This is where the, uh, this is Cedar over here, and this would be where the, um, uh, the Centennial Office Building is today and the Centennial Ramp. Uh, behind it between Minnesota and Cedar. Uh, and there was a whole collection of houses, apartments, uh, row houses, townhouses around this park, which was developed in the 1880s uh, and which sort of flittered away, fitter, uh, disappeared in the 1950s uh, as uh, the Capitol Mall was developed and uh, the land was wanted for other purposes. And by then many of the houses were already gone. Um, the Probably the most spectacular house overlooking the park was this one on the right, the Stone Blood Hardenburg house, um, designed by uh, William Wilcox and um, um, Johnston, uh, Clarence Johnston, and built in 1887, came down in 56, just as the park was being basically dismantled and the Centennial Office building was going up. Um, big, huge double houses were a Victorian thing. Uh, and if you had a lot of money, you could build a big double house. They were almost always built by family members, father and son, wife and daughter. Uh, in this case, uh, a guy named Stone built this house for his two stepson, not stepsons, his two son-in-laws, built for his two daughters and their uh, husbands. And um, the Victorian double houses, the big ones were interesting because they did not have identical floor plans. There are still a lot of uh, double houses around St. Paul, some in my neighborhood on West 7th, and typically the smaller ones that's a mirrored plan. They're like a duplex only instead of being up down there, left, right, and, the, and they're fairly symmetrical typically, but the big, the big expensive ones were not. They could be quite different in size, one unit bigger than the other, different floor plans, um, and this was one of the really grand um, double houses built in St. Paul. The builder, by the way, Stone, uh, uh, reserved an apartment for himself on the second floor and his wife. And I'm not sure that the, the, uh, the two son-in-laws and the daughters uh, really liked that arrangement, but uh, I guess it came with the, uh, the dollars to, um, to build the place. Um, so we'll take a look now, we'll move over to Summit Avenue in the Hill District. Uh, obviously Summit Avenue, still a lot of mansions there from the 1880s and earlier, um, going back to the 1860s in some cases. Uh, but a lot uh, of the mansions, especially closer to downtown, uh, where College Avenue was, where um, State Historic or the yeah the Historical Society Building History Center is today, a lot of those houses are are gone, um, basically just because of freeway expansion, uh, downtown expansion, all the usual reasons, um, urban growth just kind of ate away at those houses closer to downtown. This one is interesting. This is a McFarland Coleman house, which is was basically right across from where the cathedral is now on, on that little stretch of summit that um, goes just past the cathedral where there's some apartment buildings. Um, and um, uh, this was an, uh, a house built, a simple house built in 1870, fairly small. And it got enormously enlarged by its second owner, a man named Arnold Coleman. And he added all the usual Victorian goodies, including this rather um, not, very svelte tower that somehow got jammed between the two parts of the house. Um, uh, but that was uh, not an uncommon thing to take, to buy a smaller house and either enlarge it or tear it down. We think of teardowns as a modern phenomenon. They are not. James Day Hill tore down two houses, two mansions to build his. Uh, there were a lot of teardowns on Summit uh, and it was not at all uncommon back in the day. If you had the money to buy a relatively small house, even if it was of mansion quality, but quite old, tear it down and build a bigger house on that same lot. And that certainly happened on Summit and other parts of the city. Um, 
here's a picture, uh, a famous picture. Uh, this is sometimes called the dog sled photo. And it was taken from about where XL is today on, on West 7th. And you're looking up at Summit Avenue. And uh, this is about 1859. And uh, the Edward Neal house here on the far right is about where the James J. Hill house is today. What's interesting about this picture is that in 1859, there are already um, six mansions uh, visible in this photo on Summit. We, we often assume that people who came, pioneers who came to St. Paul, Minneapolis, you know, came with empty pockets and through pluck and hard work made their fortunes in the new, uh, the, the pioneer era uh, of these cities. And some did, but um, others already had money. They, they were from the East, they already had money and they just saw this area as a, as a big opportunity to make a whole lot more money because getting in on the ground floor is still the best advice for any kind of investment. And a lot of them did and they made more money, uh, but they were able, even when they just arrived to build pretty substantial houses um, first generation houses, you could call them. And as uh, they got richer, uh, they would build bigger houses or move to a bigger house somewhere else. And a bigger house, such as the case of the Hill House, would replace these earlier mansions. Uh, my friend Jim Sasevich, I had uh, the St. Paul House historian, I had coffee with him the other day, and he was telling me about some of the early, uh, almost unknown mansions that were up in this district. Um, uh, there were a lot of them uh, that were torn down fairly early on, sometimes in the 1870s and 1880s, um, for one reason or another to make way for larger new houses or whatnot. So there's a whole kind of a rich history here uh, of generations of mansions that have, in some cases have come and gone. Um, probably the uh, one of the, the most famous of the lost mansions on Summit, of course, is the Norman Kitson House at 201 Summit. And this is where the St. Paul Cathedral stands today although the streets have been changed around, but it's basically on the side of the cathedral. And in fact, Archbishop John Ireland bought this house for $50,000 um, and had it torn down so that he could build the cathedral. Um, and um, Kitson was one of those early capitalists who had money in all sorts of different things. Started out, he had steamboating and fur trading. He was a friend of James J. Hill. He traveled a lot in the North Woods and there are stories that allege he has as many as 26 children by various women, <laughs> um, whether they're true or not, I'm not sure, but he had 11 by his own wife or his official wife, I guess we could say. Um, so that when he died just four years after building this enormous house, um, it was quite a tangle to um, settle the estate, to put it mildly. Um, and this got turned into a, a, a very large and a very elegant rooming house, I'm sure, um, before it was torn down um, to make way for the cathedral. If you go into the Irvine Park neighborhood, there's a house there that has one of the windows from the Kitson house, which is supposedly worth a lot. And um, some of the bits and pieces of this house, as was true of many of these early mansions, um, they were, um, the, the goodies were saved uh, for, for salvage because the people who tore them down, typically in those days, didn't get paid to tear down the house. They got paid for the salvage. So wherever they could salvage from the house, they could sell. And that's how they, they paid for their, their cost of, of tearing the property down uh, in the early days. So this was, when it was built, I think in 1884, very probably the largest house in St. Paul. Uh, it's hard to tell exactly how big it was, but I'm guessing when you look at all the uh, three levels, the three stories and everything, you're, you're probably talking over 20,000 square feet. Uh, the James J. Hill Mansion um, across the street um, which still stands today, of course, is about 36,000. So this was a very, very big house. And you can see some views of it here from Selby Avenue and Dayton Avenue. Uh, the streets have been changed around here. Um, so these views are, are different from what you would see today. We didn't have John Ireland Boulevard and there's been, been a number of other changes, but um, this is actually a cable car going up uh, the Selby Avenue Hill before the streetcars arrived. Uh, there were cable cars uh, that went uh, briefly had a brief run in St. Paul for a few years uh, before um, electric streetcars arrived in 1889, 1890. And that was such a uh, superior technology that uh, other than in San Francisco, uh, cable cars went away very rapidly. By the way, the city in the United States that the biggest cable car system of all, well, believe it or not, was Chicago. Um, it was flat and cable cars actually like flat, um, but they could, they could operate on, on steep hills too. But um, uh, St. Paul had two cable car lines, one that went up Selby and one that went out East 7th. And they were powered by steam power plants at the end of the line and had a moving cable under the street. Um, but it was just a, not a, a really efficient system and electric streetcars came in. They quickly 
uh, took over. Uh, just to give you an idea, look at the, this mansion now that Kitson built in 1884. Here's where he was living when he built that house. He, he, this was his first mansion. You can see the difference between the 1850s and the 1880s, just in terms of the size of these houses uh, and the luxuriousness of them. Uh, a lot, a lot of money flowed into uh, this area. A lot of money was made in all the usual ways, but railroad in particular in St. Paul, but also in Minneapolis, obviously flour milling, lumber milling, uh, manufacturing, uh, retailing, uh, wholesaling. And the people who got in at the ground floor and built up businesses uh, in the days before income taxes uh, made tremendous amounts of money. Uh, so we'll go on here to um, this view of Summit Avenue and the Amherst Wilder House. This is the second Amherst Wilder House right here, which was right next door to the James J. Hill House. Uh, and here's a view of it in 1903. You see the Hill House here, the Wilder House. Uh, and these were the two great paired mansions um, in on Summit Avenue. And uh, you know, if you could have one Summit Avenue house back, it would be the it would be the Wilder House. It was it was really one of the, the great houses of the city, um, for various reasons didn't survive. By the way, you notice down here, you'll see these are streetcars in 1903, but you'll notice there's this little a little smaller streetcar behind it. It was called a helper car. This was before the tunnel was built to lift the streetcars up the hill uh, from what is now Cali Boulevard up to Selby. And um, that was a very steep grade, uh, too steep for streetcars and motors to, to conquer. So they had a helper, a pusher car, and a counterweight system to help get those streetcars up and down. It was, a, it was a cumbersome system, and that's why they, they dug out the tunnel, which reduced that grade substantially and enabled streetcars to um, maneuver on their own up to the top of the, up to the, top of the hill. Uh, here are some views of the Wilder Mansion. Wonderful house, uh, Clarence Johnston, Wilcox and Johnson design. Here's a view from looking down uh, at the bottom of the Selby Avenue Hill. You can see the tower. Um, very large house, uh, baronial two-story hall. That was its um, uh, was its glory, uh, and it was torn down in 1959. Uh, the archdiocese had acquired the house, um, will to them by the Wilder family, and um, they. Um, they used it as a chancery uh, for quite a while, but it got to be a huge problem, maintenance, cost, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was torn down in 1959. Um, and I was surprised looking at old newspaper stories, how little publicity there was. There were pictures and there were a couple articles here and there in the Pioneer Press and the Dispatch, but um, there wasn't a sense in those days uh, of uh, historic preservation that I think we, hopefully we have now. And so a house like this could basically be torn down you know, tear, tear it down. Nobody needs to review it. It's we own it. We can tear it down. Um, and unfortunately, it, it it didn't last. But this would have been one to definitely save. Um, here's another house that has gone on some of the Andrew Muir House from uh, 545 Summit out closer to Dale. Another one of the Augustus Gager houses. And look at the tower on this thing. One, two, three, four story tower. Lots of uh, stuff going on, uh, kind of your classic mad dog Victorian house with uh, you know everything you can think of. This came down in 44, I'm not sure why, if it was just kind of falling apart or um, I don't know if there was a fire or no, something. Like I, I have the book I can read. Hello, uh, um, somebody is talking here, but anyway. Um, uh, this, this is the Mirror House from 1886-1944. Uh, um, Summit Park and um, uh, Marshall Avenue, uh, again, uh, it, it's complicated to describe, but Summit Avenue was relocated when the cathedral was built, it was moved. And then when John Ireland Boulevard was built, there was moves and parts of a part of Marshall Avenue, which was known at one time as Nelson Avenue, got lopped off. And there was this park here called Summit Park and that's gone. This is, the, uh, um, this is the view from the Kitson house. And this was the, um, one of the big houses there, Charles Dickerman house, uh, had this wonderfully strange, um, um, this wonderfully strange uh, um, aspect <laughs> in its gable here. It would look like a musical instrument had been stuck up there. Um, Gager was, uh, liked his ornament. And this is one of the most heavily ornamented of his houses. Dickerman was a, a real estate guy who um, made a lot of money in St. Paul in real estate. 
built this house. And you can see it came down in 55, which was when the John Ireland Boulevard uh, was being uh, pushed through and the Capitol Mall was being completed. And that whole area where the Vote Tech School is, well, the old Vote Tech School, St. Paul Colleges, um, was all greatly changed and a lot of houses were, were cleared away at that time. Uh, up on Crocus Hill, a couple of big mansions um, designed by Wilcox and Johnston. Uh, the Russell Door House, beautiful shingle style house was up on the hill. And the biggest, which was I think the biggest of all the Crocus Hill houses was the Theodore Schirmeyer House, um, built in 1887, 1888, uh, came down in 1927. Schirmeyer was part of a Linda Key Warner and Schirmeyer, a big uh, uh, wholesaling firm in St. Paul, I think dry goods. Um, this view is interesting. Oops. Um, it shows um, the pathway up to the house. And if you go up the Grand Avenue Hill today and you make that turn near the top of the hill where there's that red brick, newer red brick apartment building, basically you're looking at that spot. And there was a driveway up through there that went up to what is now called Crocus Hill, the avenue up above there, the street. And that was how you reached the Schirmeyer Mansion. That's obviously been changed. Um, um, huge house, probably 20,000 square feet. Don't know too much about it. I've read some descriptions of it, but only a few photographs have I been able to find uh, of, the, of the exterior. Um, but one of the really, really big houses in St. Paul. Um, one of my favorites, the Augusta Larpenter House, which was called Anchorage. And this was um, on um, Concordia, but now Concordia Avenue, but was of course Rondo Avenue at Dale. Uh, and it was built in 1860 and then enlarged uh, in 1891. Uh, and torn down when the freeway came through, when 94 came through in 1959. Built for August Larpenter, who Larpenter Avenue, a, a legendary name in St. Paul. Uh, he was quite the fellow, by all accounts, a very quick and lively fellow, lived to be 95 years old, which was an enormous age in those days, and lived in the house pretty much uh, all of his adult life until the last couple of years when he, I think, got quite frail and moved out to live with uh, a daughter. There weren't a lot of big houses in this neighborhood, but there, it, it was, uh, you know, one of the, uh, would have been the kind of house if you were a kid and lived in that neighborhood, you would have gone by and said, who, who, who lives in that big house? Well, it was August Larpenter. Uh, we're going to go over to Rice Park, West 7th, West Side, real quickly. Uh, we're going to move along here because we're running late. Um, I like this picture of Rice Park um, taken uh, in the 1880s uh, because you can see where the, uh, the Ordway is now. Um, there were row houses and there were quite a few around Rice Park at one time, uh, but they were mostly gone by the 1920s. Uh, there was too much commercial pressure on Rice Park. Uh, it couldn't survive the way Irvine Park did. It was, it was too close to downtown St. Paul, the auditorium, STEM Hall, uh, which is gone now, but uh, the auditorium complex and Riverview, or River Center, um, were back here, were built in uh, 1907, the St. Paul Auditorium, STEM Hall, and a lot of this stuff got cleared away uh, at various times. I think in the 50s, there was actually a service station, believe it or not, a gas station sitting here. Uh, so we'd be looking at, uh, if this were a, a more modern view, the St. Paul uh, Public Library, Hill Ref the old Hill Reference Library would be right, right here. Um, the Bishop's Residence, this was maybe the most elaborate private house in St. Paul in 1860, built for the Bishop, one of the second Bishop of St. Paul, Thomas Grace. I find it kind of interesting that <clears throat> the first St. Paul Cathedral, this was at 6th and uh, <clears throat> 6th and St. Peter, 6th Street here, St. Peter here. The, the first church was not particularly grand. Uh, it was a pretty simple structure, but the Bishop's house was, was nice. Uh, it was as big uh, and elaborate a private house as probably existed in St. Paul in 1860, built of a local Platteville limestone and uh, quite an elaborate place. Apparently the plumbing was not great. It did not have indoor plumbing. Some of those early mansions we saw uh, up in the uh, lower town area, the 1860s, like the Thompson House and the early Wilder and uh, Sibley houses, they had indoor plumbing even back in the 1860s. Uh, they had water from piped in, they had central heating. This building did not have either one of those. So the bishop had to use the pottery out back, I guess. Um, uh, but a very large elaborate house. And this came down at the same time the old cathedral did in 1914, uh, when of course the new cathedral was, um, was opened. Uh, right across um, on, um, uh, across on uh, Rice Park, uh, in front of where the St. Paul Hotel is today um, was the Charles Zimmerman house. Uh, one of my favorites in, in St. Paul. This was a little urban townhouse. If you go to places like St. Louis, you'll find tons of these. 
the old parts of town, but there weren't a lot of them built in the Twin Cities. They just weren't. And this is one of my favorites, kind of a little more style concoction designed by Alan Stem, who was an excellent architect and a very uh, beautifully finished house. Zimmerman was a photographer. He uh, ran a, a fleet of boats out at uh, Lake Minnetonka. He was called the Commodore. Real interesting character, born in France, but came here when he was four years old um, and lived in this townhouse, which um, was eventually uh, raised in 1926 to make way for a building. Uh, there was a, a building sometimes called the St. Paul Hotel Garage, which was actually originally a commercial building um, behind the hotel. Uh, and that was later torn down. And now we have, the, of course, the parking ramp uh, next to the, the hotel and, and um, other buildings there on that site. Uh, but just a, a really cute little house that I would think would be a fun to have in downtown St. Paul. By the way, these were called Dodge's Alpine Cottages. There were two of these little Gothic style wooden cottages next door to it that were actually rental properties. Um, West 7th Street uh, had um, some of the earliest mansions in St. Paul. These were the, the Swift Robertson house, which was originally at Sherman and 7th, but was moved around um, corner to Sherman Street at a later date and the, what's called the Fuller Emmett House, the um, uh, Lafayette Emmett, uh, Elpheus Fuller House. Um, both of these date to around 1853. These are examples of the, what, what is the sort of the large style Greek revival house uh, with the big columns in front. Um, most of the Greek revival that survives in St. Paul is much simpler. It's your little houses that have a little A-frame sort of look to them, uh, side entry. Uh, you'll find houses like this, a lot of houses like this out in places uh, out east. Uh, Michigan, uh, Ohio, uh, Indiana, built in the 1820s and 1830s. The style got St. Paul in the 1850s. Um, there are, as far as I know, none of these um, columned Greek revival houses where they were actually fully built in the 1850s here. There's one in Irvine Park, but the colonnade is, is newer. Um, uh, so these were, this, these would have been houses probably of three to 5,000 square feet, if that, but they would have considered very substantial houses um, in their time. Uh, Pleasant Avenue had a lot of mansions. Uh, the old Pleasant Avenue right below, um, right below Summit where 35E now comes, comes through. There were um, many big houses there at one time. Um, here's an early Greek revival house, the Dodge Conrad Searle house. Searle was an antique dealer, well-known in St. Paul. George Mitch house, uh, Mitch was a, uh, owned a wagon company, uh, Mitch and Heck, that was nearby. And by the way, next door here is the old People's Church, which burned down in 1940. And that was the same year the Mitch House came down. I, I don't know for sure, but I wonder if it was actually damaged in that fire. Um, big um, French Second Empire house. Um, and all the Summit Avenue, all the Pleasant Avenue uh, houses are of course gone. Uh, Pleasant Avenue still exists. I bike on it sometimes. There's little sections of it down on the West End, uh, but you don't find any mansions like this along there anymore. Uh, West Side had some mansions up on the bluffs, uh, not as many as other parts around um, downtown. There are still some up on uh, Prospect Terrace in that area, uh, off of Wabasha, up the hill where the, the staircase used to be. Um, this was the Paul Martin house. He was an early real estate developer. And this later got turned into a hospital for many years, became part of, I think it was Riverview Hospital, before it was finally torn down. Great tower, which must have had a, a fabulous view. Apparently, they performed surgery up here uh, when it was a hospital because the light was so good. How they got the patients up there, I don't even want to think about. They must have carried them up the steps. I don't think they could have gotten an elevator in there. Maybe they did. Um, and the Adolph Rosen house, this was right at uh, right off Smith and uh, Cherokee. Um, and he had a, a fur business right below on the, on the west, um, west side flats and built this beautiful stone house in 1899. Um, and this came down in 1963 and there's now the apartment building up there, uh, River's Edge, River Terra, I can't remember what it's called, um, that's on that site that was built in the 60s. Uh, but the, uh, the, the really big mansions, there weren't a whole lot of them over on the west side compared to other parts of town. All right, so we're gonna take a quick swing around St. Paul and wrap this show up. Um, there were mansions built in other parts of St. Paul around the downtown core. And of course, obviously there are a lot of them that exist today along River Road and Summit Avenue and whatnot. Uh, but there are other parts of town where there were um, some big houses that have gone away. Uh, the McKenty Davidson House, which was on the Southeast side of Como Lake, um, 1858, circa 1906. This started out as a hotel, then became a residential property, then became a hotel again. Um, 
and um, was owned by a fellow named Henry McKenty, who was a huge real estate developer who lost all his money in the depression of 1873, I think it was, and ended up committing suicide at age 48. Uh, went into a friend's house, took out a pistol, shot himself in the head. Uh, his 16 year old daughter apparently later committed suicide as did his wife, uh, his widow. Uh, kind of a sad St. Paul story there leaving a, a sole daughter as a survivor of this once wealthy man's family. The house was later, uh, later became a house used by the Davidson family and they were famous, um, um, John Davidson, I think was the owner. And he had six children, all of whom were skaters, uh, ice skaters, uh, including uh, Mabel Davidson who became a well-known figure skater and Harley Davidson, not the motorcycle guy uh, who was a speed skater. And the whole family supposedly learned how to speed skate and, and skate on, on Como Lake which by the way, McKenty named, it used to be called Sandy Lake and McKenty gave it the more romantic name of Como Lake. At least that's the story. Uh, another house that's uh, not too well known, the Hatch Nettleton house up on Randolph near Lexington uh, where the apartments are today. Um, this is the, uh, the first version of the house uh, built by a man named Hatch um, in, 18, in the 1860s. Uh, stone house, uh, again, Italian in style with that tower. That burned down in 1876, and then a um, guy named Nettleton built another house on the site. Um, and then it later became, I think, a, a company that sold bottled water, didn't it? Or, or spring water, uh, I think it did. And, um, whoops, I'm happy to later. Um, um, that had a very large uh, amount of land um, and was, you know, typical of these sort of estates that were scattered around back in the day when more land was available and the city hadn't developed as much. Finally, of course, the greatest of all the estates in St. Paul was, um, which Jay Fender from the Historical Society, Ramsey County has done a lot of research on, the Oliver Crosby House at 302 Mississippi River Boulevard um, between, um, St. Clair and Jefferson, basically, um, and um, called Stonebridge, and that's where Stonebridge Avenue gets its name. Uh, this was the great estate in the history of St. Paul, 28 acres. Crosby was a founder of the American Hoist and Dairy Company, an engineer, very talented man, maybe a mechanical genius, made a ton of money, and um, in 1916, built this huge mansion on these magnificent grounds. He had um, um, landscape architects come in to uh, design the grounds. He um, built a, um, these are the days before, you know, permits and uh, environmental impact statements and all that stuff. He built a, a reservoir up on the top of the bluff, uh, ran the water down the side of the bluff um, and in, through his property in a, a little creek bed and then put a lake next to his house where he could go out and on rowboats after parties. Um, uh, one of the waterfalls is still there. The, it doesn't have water anymore, but you can find it in the backyard of one of the houses up on Stonebridge uh, Avenue up there. Um, uh, just uh, to be west of Cretan. Um, uh, so he had this 28 acre estate, this enormous house, um, which I've often found amusing was shaped. He, he made American Hoist and Derrick was known for their cranes and hoisting equipment among other things. And so when Crosby built this house, it's a Derrick. Yeah, it's a crane, see, it's got the arm out there and um, uh, had all the servants quarters and things there. He had an 11 car garage staffed by a chauffeur. Um, these are, these grounds, here's the here's the impounded lake up here and here's Lake uh, Emily named after his wife here and the little waterfalls were along here. He had a, an alley or open mall to the, uh, to the river, uh, very careful plantings on the property. Uh, all sorts of, uh, uh, of goodies that money could afford. He had these elaborate gardens to the south where he'd have these big parties. Uh, alas and alack, uh, Crosby built the house in 1916. He died in 1922. His wife died in 1928. And his son, his only son lived in the house for a while. But by the 30s, they wanted out and, the, and they were ready to redevelop the entire, to re subdivide the entire property, which eventually happened, although it, it took a while because of the depression and other things. Um, the house itself, um, the city suggested at one point using it as a governor's mansion, which would have been, I think, quite spectacular if, if it had been all intact, although by the 50s, it, the, it was basically just the house and, and a lot of other development around it. Um, but that never happened. And so the house was unfortunately torn down in 1953. There was never an estate, I don't think anywhere in Minneapolis, St. Paul proper 
to match this one. This was the big one. Um, and um, boy, I would love to have seen that in its, uh, in its heyday. And, and it looks sort of Gatsby-esque with these parties out here, people in their, their fine evening clothes. And I could be out there on the, on the blue lawn and, and talking to Gatsby and finding out uh, what the heck Daisy was up to. Anyway, um, that's just a very brief look. Um, if you, uh, my book, Once There Were Castles, has many more houses uh, featured in it. Um, and I always tell people, by God, it would make a lovely Christmas present for somebody um, if you don't have it already. Uh, coming next spring will be the end of the Sherlockian Rafferty cycle. Uh, Rafferty's last case uh, will be out, um, University of Minnesota Press. I'm assuming it'll be probably April or thereabouts, and it'll bring uh, the Rafferty, Rafferty's um, story and Holmes's visits to St. Paul to a close. It's all set in St. Paul in 1928. So uh, I think that is it. And um, if um, anybody has any questions, I would be happy to entertain them briefly. Great. Thank you, Larry. That was fantastic. Um, we do have some questions um, and comments. Sure. Um, there was a question about near Lafayette Boulevard is Kitson Street. Was the, Kins was the Kitson Mansion near there and what was the relationship with the uh, no it wasn't it, it wasn't and um the um i assume i don't know i'd have to look at donald emson's book on uh, st paul street names uh, to be sure but i assume the street was probably named after kitson but no the mansion neither the first nor the second mansion were uh were on the east side one was up on uh, more the older one was up on jackson um near 12th in that area um and of course, the newer one was over uh, on Summit, but uh, I don't think Kitson had um, a house. Oh, I could be wrong. He could have lived over there for a time, but I don't think he had a house on the east side. Um, there was a question about if the 14-year-old boy that uh, burnt down the ham house, is he still living? Or did you ever find out what happened to him? If <laughs> I do not know. Um, he could be. Is he 1954? He'd be... Uh, what is that 1940 so he'd be 60 70 he'd be 81 years old he could be um there were newspaper stories at the time uh and honestly i don't recall if the boy was ever named he probably was in those days they didn't um typically excise juveniles names from the newspapers and i don't really know if it was accidental or just you know uh uh deliberate or he was just playing with matches and having but you know if you go into an old house and start playing with matches uh, that's full of wood, um, bad things might happen. Um, yeah. I don't know the full story. It's something, you know, it, one of my great regrets is that the, um, the Pioneer Press and Dispatch are not uh, online for the most part uh, until the 1980s. There are some little bits of them you can find, uh, segments of them that are, um, uh, have been digitized or online, but you can't, most of them aren't yet. I hope someday they will be because it would be a tremendous move. The Minneapolis papers now, the, the, the Tribune, and you can go back 150 years uh, on their database. You got to pay a little money a month, but I use it all the time. It's a tremendous resource because, you know, if it's digitized, then it's searchable. And when I did like Lost Twin Cities, I spent too many hours, more hours than I can possibly account for in libraries, you know, paging through microfilms. And oh, Lord, that's a... That's not a job that's any fun. Um, so um, so it, it's hard to, uh, I used to, when I worked at the Pioneer Press, I could often go into their archives and dig out stuff, but I don't have that capacity to do that anymore. And that was all hand archives, just clippings. Um, and they're not digitized. I think they started digitizing in 88. So, um, but if we had those old St. Paul papers available uh, online, if somebody wants to, Ramsey County Historical Society <laughs> wants to take on that project, um that would be great and i think then i hear somewhere they might be doing that i don't know uh but yeah i'm not sure i haven't gotten any yeah updates um, but that there. would be a, that would be a great historic resource it, it would it would help many people i think yeah absolutely um okay that was a fun question um let's see i'm going to come back to brad's question about the ramsey hill cathedral hill neighborhood um but there was a question about the house across from the James J. Hill house um, from the Kitson house that later became the cathedral. Do you know anything about that house briefly? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure which house you're referring to. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Suzanne, if you want to put more details in that, we'll come back to that. Um, Cynthia had a, had a 
comment about the bishop's residence is now Kincaid's um, or in four commons and the cathedral was the ham building. Right. Yeah. They're, and they're both basic. They, they're both on the site of the, uh, the, the, they're both on the site of the hand building and the parking lot adjacent to it. Um, the the, the uh, Bishop's house was on sixth, not on St. Peter. Um, Bill's question about prior to the closure of the, of the big stairway by the Hill mansion, it was a popular place to, you know, for people to walk and run. Um, and his question is, do you know what the function of the little door that was in the photo or on the, on the dry hill, the steep hill, was that leading to something or? Uh, I'm not sure uh, which which stairway you're talking about. The Bill, I'm not sure which one he was talking about. The one by the the big stairway by the Hill Mansion, I think. Or are you talking about the one by the um, the stairway by the um, um, up on Capitol Heights, the the ones behind the Capitol there, the Merriam and um, Ben's houses. Yeah, I'm not sure, Bill. I have to yeah, come back. To that. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I guess I'm not sure which stairway you're referring to. Um, Jean had a quick question about north of University Avenue and east of 35E, there was a section neighborhood called Williams Hill. Do you uh -huh. know if there were mansions there? Yeah, well, there were some big houses there. I mean, it, was, it was not, there was a, a big house up there, which um, uh, appears and might even be in, um, might even be in, um, once there were castles, there was a, a big house up there that was used as kind of a rooming house for immigrants up on the hill. Uh, it wasn't considered a fancy neighborhood, but if you've been through the Railroad Island neighborhood, you know there are some, there are still a few, you know, uh, fairly sizable uh, Queen Anne type of houses up there. Uh, but it was never um, uh, a real fancy part of town. There are too many railroad tracks around. And if you were around railroad tracks, you didn't tend to attract mansions, or if you had mansions, they were <laughs> they were quickly abandoned by their owners and became, you know, rooming houses and that sort of thing, because uh, that was just not considered a desirable thing back in the day when they were all burning coal and wood. Oh, sure. Um, let's see. There was a question about if you know the names of the six families who were the pioneers who lived on Summit Avenue. Uh, I do. They're in my book. Uh... And I'd have to look them up. If someone wants to email they, uh, me, they can. There were, uh, I know uh, Henry Rice, I believe, had one of them. Uh, Edward Neal, who was one of the founders, I think, of McAllister College. Uh, and they are, um, I do talk about them in um, Once There Were Castles, uh, briefly. Yeah. Uh, and I think there were not only those six, but there were others. Uh, I know Jim Sasevich has been digging around into that came and went fairly quickly. Um, that very early period of building in St. Paul, you know, uh, 1850s to through the 1870s and into the early 1880s is fairly obscure. You gotta do a lot of digging around in real estate records and things like that because there were no building permits then. Uh, so you don't really have any helpful city records. You can use old maps, but the insurance maps don't really start coming in until the 1880s. So it's a, it, it requires some real granular digging to find out. And of course, finding images of those real early houses uh, and buildings can be, can be very difficult. Uh, finding images of many houses can be difficult, period, but particularly so with those very early ones. Right, you know, that is hard for people. Um, so question about the Hinkle House and the George Mitz House. And those are both in, are, is the Hinkle House in your book? I can't remember. I believe it. That's the one out by um, uh, Como, right? I think that's, oh, wait, the Hinkle House. That's the one up by, um, that's the one up by, uh, yeah, 12930, the Hinkle House. Uh, yeah, that's in the book. Um, let's see here. Uh, people are always amazed that I don't remember what I wrote, but I've written too many books. Um, the, uh, let's see, the Hinkle House is mentioned here somewhere. It is mentioned in the book in passing, but it doesn't, it isn't, um, uh, yeah, here it is. There's a picture of it actually on page uh, 130. Uh, that was the one, um, it, what they called Union Park up off the university, kind of in the Irish Park area now. And there's a picture of that and a, a brief discussion of it, but nothing, nothing in any detail. What was the other one you're asking about? Um, the George Mitt. 
Mitch house. Yeah, um, I don't I don't know too much about that house. Um, there are some other pictures of it. I know I've I've run across maybe not under that name. I think sometimes it shows up in pictures of the people's church next door. I think that's the same. Uh, I think it was descendants of that family who had the restaurant down on West Seventh for years, which is now Bennett's, which we call Mitch's. Uh, I'm not positive on that, but I know I, I had lunch there with Don Boxmeyer a few times back in the day. I think that that's part of the Mitch family. Um, I don't, but I don't really know a great deal about that house. Okay. Um, oh, there were a couple comments about Kitson Street. Um, Ralph says that Kitson Street fragment is now the off ramp from Highway 52 to yep. East 7th. Yep. And then Cynthia, um, who is a great researcher, said the, that the Empson book says that Kitson Street is indeed named after Norman Kitson. And I don't ah, have okay. a copy of that. So thank you, Cynthia, for looking yep. that up. Um, and then Deborah, who is also uh, wrote the book about Alvin Karpis along with Cynthia, um, said that she thinks that the newspapers identified the boy who burned the ham house as Johnny. But I mean, how many Johnnies were oh, there? Johnny, <laughs> little torch you, Johnny. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'd have to go back and um, and try to dig out those. Uh, I don't. I might even have some old files on that. I don't know. But um, but yeah, I, I don't know if they if they identified juveniles back in the 50s. Um, they, they put a lot of stuff in the papers in the 50s that we don't put in there today, but I don't know if they if they identified juveniles. Um, oh, and Suzanne went back to her question about over the house over by the cathedral. Um, the house that she was referring to was torn down to make the cathedral parking lot and her grandmother was born there. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, that would be somewhere in, also in Sandine's book on, um, on Summit Avenue. I'm sure. I don't think I don't think I have it in um, one silver castles. Uh, as I said, there are uh, I have in my database of lost Twin Cities mansions, uh, which is just really a list. I have um, although I do I also have a database of lost downtown, a more formal database of lost downtown mansions in St. Paul and Minneapolis, among other things. But my database of, of uh, my list of lost mansions that I was able to run across to find some reference to in St. Paul and Minneapolis in the suburbs is well over 600. And as I say, I think there are, you know, quite a few, a large number that are accounted for, especially the real early ones. Um, I just think there, there were a lot of them up, there were early ones up on Capitol Heights. There were certainly early ones on Summit uh up on the east side i mean they're just yeah there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of disappeared without much of a trace right um so going back to that there was a question about um was there ever anything on the far east side um by the hillcrest neighborhood that you know of um probably not uh you know there there are some nice houses out in hazel park uh going back to the 1880s including one the schneider house which is a beautiful shingle style house but not a lot of big mansions, I don't think. Uh, and the Hillcrest area, I think was, uh, I could be wrong, was that Far East side, a lot of that wasn't developed until the 50s. Um, um, yeah. If you go up there, a lot of the houses are from actually 1950s vintage houses. So to answer um, Suzanne's question from our editor, um, uh, we think that Suzanne is talking about 217th Summit, which was once owned by Eliza Edgerton Newport and her family, which could be that same house. Um, if you check on our website, rchs.com, in the publishing tab in the winter 2019 issue, there's a great story by Christine Potus Larson about Eliza Edgerton Newport and um, the work she did, um, who was a, a, a relative of Christine. Oh. So I probably, I probably read that article at some point. But, yeah, right? no, it's a good story. Um, it's exited my brain, as have many things. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so Cynthia had a question, and I will let you answer that in the chat. And then um, before we get back to Brad's question, because we're running low on time, um, Ellen, just quickly, um, wanted to ask how we start to research the history of your own 1890s home up on the bluff on the west side above Harriet Island. My own house? Well, they're her house. Oh, her house. Oh, I, was gonna say, I did live on the west side for many years, but not in an 1890s house. Um, well, um, you know, there's a, uh, you might want to look at the, I think you can find it online in various places. The Northwest Architectural Archives puts out a pamphlet on how to research a house history. And it has lots of good advice on looking at building permits and things like that and other sources. Um, 
and uh, that might be your, your best place to start or just um, you know, uh, uh, visit the, well, you can't visit the Historical Society Library these days because you, you get an appointment, I guess. But, but I would uh, look at that. I, I know it's online. I've seen it online. If you go to the Northwest Architectural Archives website or just look up how to research your house uh, on Google and um, you'll find lots of, of hints. Uh, building permits in St. Paul go back to the 1880s. So that's always a source. And of course, Ramsey County Landmark Center, the uh, historical society has um, building permits and that's a good it really be a good place to start to get some basic info finding photographs can be really tricky unless it's a fairly well-known house or you know you have some in, someone in the family or someone knows other families that live there original families you can get it you can delve into real estate records um, at, at the county and um, those can be very revealing but I, I think anybody who's worked with real estate documents knows they're they're hard to work with. Uh, real estate law is Byzantine, and um, I had some. I did a research on my, I've done a, a whole research project on my grandparents from Donnelly, Minnesota, and even dealing with Morris County property tax records was <laughs> an adventure. Um, you can hire someone like Jim Savich or a house detective or researcher to help you out. There are people who do that. Um, so there, there are lots of approaches. But I would, I would start with that pamphlet, which would give you a lot of a lot of basic ideas about uh, avenues that you can pursue to find out more about your house. And you know, if you can find anything in the attic, <laughs> that's always a, you know, that's always a good deal. I have had many stories of people telling me, "Oh, I was up in the attic. I found these blueprints." You know, so you never know. Right. And thank you for mentioning our research center. We are back open by appointment, and we do have the building permits as well as old phone books, yep. plat maps, and all kinds of things to help people research their house. We don't have an ancestral genealogical information, but we do have the house yep. information. And so. things like ancestry.com, if you want to pay the money, um, and other sources like that can be very helpful if you have some names and you find out who the people were and where they came from, and you start they'll start pointing you to uh, city directories and census data and things like that um, can all be very helpful. There's an immense amount of stuff now online. It's out there. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out how to get to it. Hey, and Cynthia, oh, Carrie, I'm sorry. Carrie posted a link. Um, I want to Thank everybody. I apologize if we didn't get to your question or comment. Um, thank you, Larry. Thank sure. you, everybody, for coming. It was a fantastic program. I'm going to stop the recording. And please join us for another program soon. Check out our website for upcoming programs, including Julie's program on Hazel Belva, which is going to be really fun. We also have a great program coming up on Jean Follett, who was another St. Paul artist. So, um, and we're planning next year. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.